Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to the series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three new or upcoming settings for your TTRPG that are really weird. I mean, when I say weird, I mean, you know, Electric Bastion Land uh, isn't quite weird enough. <laughs> or, or, or things like, you know, this is like Ultraviolet Grasslands. So, I mean, this is the sort of, these are the sort of settings that are really evocative, really imaginative, that, that are not going to be to everyone's taste. Just instantly off the bat, people are going to be like, nope. Other people are going to be like, whoa. And I think that that's an interesting thing in our hobby, that you have worlds and settings like that, products like that, um, games like that, that are just really, really unique and draw you right in. So I wanted to go through three of these. Now, um, the first two are uh, basically like first editions or, I mean, this one's just a, like a like a sample. Um, the first one, the Painted Wastelands, is just a sample. But the, the actual adventure world setting product thing hasn't actually been released yet. I think it's going to be kickstarted. But I'll put links below to where you can find out more about it. Painted Wastelands. The second one I'm going to be looking at is Cloud Empress, which is an ecological science fantasy RPG. This is the 1.1 rulebook. This is a setting for mothership, essentially. But the, the, the full thing, uh, or maybe the second edition, depending on how you look at it, is coming out and it's being kickstarted now. So you can get that on Kickstarter. And I'll put links below where we can get it. But this is the first uh, edition of the book, and you can get a sense of what the world is like from this first edition book. Um, and then the last one is The Wild Sea. This is just the quick start playtest, which is by Felix Isaacs. And this is such an interesting setting, such an interesting uh, world. And I think there, uh, uh, like an expansion to it was just kickstarted, but you can still pre-order the expansion and uh, you can get, get the original and all that stuff. So it's, it, the, all three of these are unique. They're, they're weird and they're different. And they are going to be, um, well, some people are going to like them, some people are going to hate them. But I think all of them are just interesting throughout. So let's go through the Painted Wasteland. This is just a quick start uh, sample, as I said, and it's only five pages. This is really short. The other two are much longer. This one's just short, but I think it's worth putting on your radar if it's not already on there. Um, first of all, you can see just by the cover page, the art is bizarre and phenomenal and gruesome and uh, just nightmarish. Dreamlike, if you have, if you like your nightmares, I suppose. <laughs> But, but but certainly it stands out. It, you, you're, this is the kind of setting that you instantly see and are drawn, at least I am instantly drawn to. You get a very simple uh, contents here. And what you basically have are the, the, the contents of a few hexes in the world. The world is going to be um, a hex crawl uh, and you get a basic description of what it is. So you have area 0506. The world has finally stopped spinning. You're lying in a puddle of vomit. Your sanity is shredded. Every fiber and atom of your being is deliciously warped. You have no idea where you are. In all directions, a barren wasteland stretches forth as far as the eye can see. The air is dry and sticky, like waking up from a multi-day nap. There are distant mountains jutting out into the sky, and everything seems to be the color of rainbow sherbet ice cream. An albino bat demon is trying to rip a painted skull out of a nearby pile of rocks. The skull is screaming in dream tongue, Help, help, I won't someone grant me aid? All right, there you go. That's your start. The pale white flesh, the albino bat demon, covered in ritual scars and sigils. AC 5 or 14, hit dice 2, 9 hit points, attacks 2, claws. So these stats are given in like old school essentials or old school generally um, forms. So you can use that for, for certainly um, any kind of old school game the setting would work. Questions and answers that the skull can give you, right? Where are we? The painted wastelands, outer dreamlands, the endless plain, a lower ethereal hierarchy. What do you mean none of that made sense? The Painted Wastelands, a colorful desert on the raggedy edge of the Endless Plain, home to the pilgrimage of Yal de Bithos, a uh, sacred journey to wash away curses and stains, and other various other and various other desert weirdos. Who are you? Damn, deep question. I was a sorcerer once, I think, or maybe the cosmic ebb and flow just spat me out fully formed. Suffice to say, I'm here now, and that's the best any of any of us can hope for. The Endless Plain. It's a plane that literally is endless. It continues forever and ever. If you travel in a straight line, enough line, long enough, you'll reach the hundred year ocean. If you sail that for a hundred years, you'll reach the hundred year coast and the lands of dust beyond that. Really cool, really evocative ideas here. Um, and you get some really weird stuff going through. Here's the sorcerer's marketplace. The air is filled with the bustling sound of people shouting, laughing, yelling, and trading in dream tongue. The air is thick with a hazy smell of strange foods and the vibrant glow of ectoplasm merchants. There are hundreds of strange market stalls here, and thousands of merchants and shoppers rub elbows and run errands. Presented in this book are just a few examples of the strange wares available. What can you get? 
Well, you can get certainly stuff like chain armor and a battle axe, a week's rations. Uh, but you can also buy an alien mummy. Or an ectoplasmic generator. Or a wizard, a wizard gulp, which is something to drink. <laughs> mummy liver powder, which is something to eat. Very strange. It reminds me of like a weird combination of, um, well, it certainly it's heavily, it seems, heavily, heavily, heavily influenced by um, ultraviolet grasslands. Really. But also there's a good amount of stuff like um, the Electrum Archive in here, the Vaults of Varn, uh, just a whole bunch of those science fantasy and um, gonzo settings that you get up there. And this is the last page. Or last, oh no, you get you get one more. So really, it's ten pages, I suppose, because uh, it's it's a spread in the form that I have. You have the pastel house. There is a heady haze of fluorescent smoke in the air. The space is filled with the sound of raucous laughter, jaunty music, and brains melting. The pastel house is a tavern where you can purchase meals, drinks, and mind coagulating psychedelics, as well as learn some valuable information about interesting nearby locations. What happens if you smoke ectoplasm? strange side effects it's not it's not safe and then you get this horrible layer of the laughing spider uh, just absolutely horrible it's a baby face on a spider just why <laughs> that's sort of like the question that's what the skull asks you why why <laughs> and then you get this deck of strange theme theme uh, deck of strange things which is basically like a deck of many things right things stuff happens to you you draw a random card and weird stuff happens to you. And that's it. That's all that you get. But it's a good sample of the kind of stuff you're going to run into, I think, in this setting. And again, it's going to be some for some people. It's not going to be for others. I think it's really interesting. I'm certainly going to get it when it comes out. Just like I, you know, I use uh, Ultraviolet Grasslands for insp in inspiration. And I think Ultraviolet Grasslands has a bit more of a pleasant tone. I mean, it's not as jarring. The art isn't as jarring. The, the weirdness isn't as grotesque on the surface. It is if you go down a level, right? But it's much more implied, and the art, I find it very, very pleasant, mostly. Uh, this is different. This is much more um, gross, right? It's much more um, shocking than it is uh, just simply pleasant. But it is still inspirational, and it's still weird, and it's still the sort of thing that I'm going to come to and go, whoa, that's interesting. Maybe I should add something like that into my game. <laughs> or maybe I should run this for a one-shot or, you know, again, whatever. Painted Wastelands, I think it's worth looking into. Um, and again, I'll put links below to where you can find out more information. The second one is Cloud Empress. This is from Mothership. Now, I, I have very little contact with Mothership. I don't tend to like that style of horror. The body horror, the really gruesome, you know, death in space sort of feeling. <laughs> but there are a lot of Mothership products that I really, really like. Um... Uh, I think the Desert Moon of Karth is one of my favorite. I think that's for Mothership. That's one of my favorite, like, little standalone settings. I love it. Um, and it, it has a little bit of that, but it is just, I don't know, I like the vibe of that product quite a lot. Um, Cloud Empress is similar. It's on the borderline, just like the Painted Wastelands. It's on the borderline of what I like. It's a little weird. It reminds me of, like, Kingdom Death Monster in its overview. I don't know. Um, but... There's a lot of inspiration here. A lot of really good ideas here. And one of the things is that a lot of the stuff you can get for Cloud Empress is free. I mean, there's a lot of, like, you can get a lot of the um, the uh, newsletters, which have a lot of cool information about the setting for free. They're just a couple pages, but they really are, you know, just great inspiration. So I'm going to go through. You get There's a wounds table and a panic table uh, right away. Miscasts and curses, and you get the credits table here. Um, you get the uh, the overall book and it's all hyperlinked now one of the things that I, I really like about this is just the aesthetic the aesthetic of this book is really good I mean, like, this is the kind of art you get it's very evocative very imaginative it's it's a particular kind of setting and the art does justice to that it's not hod it's not homogenous uh it's not generic right it, you, the, and and the one of the problems you often find with really weird settings um is that the art doesn't fit that particular vibe um, you'll be just, something will be very, very, you know, descriptive and awesome in the description, and then you'll get a piece of art for it, and it's just kind of generic, or it's AI generated these days, or something like that. That's not the case in this book. The, the the tone and the art are completely synchronized. They go really, really well together. Welcome to the hereafter. That's how you start off. This is the year of your journey, the summer of the century brood, the summer of the missing empress, the summer of adventure. Welcome to the hereafter. 
So you have these things, um, basically they're like giant locusts, but they're kind of like, mm, um, they're sort of like, well, they're really, really powerful. And you don't mess with these swarms of these things for uh, for no reason. They're giant and they're dangerous and they will just destroy, but they're, they're the century brood. They're called the Imago. They're these massive, uh, yeah, these massive locusts. And uh, you're in the, the setting starts in the, the summer of the century brood. The thousands upon thousands of Imago claw their way up from the deep within the soil and reduce what little civilization still stands to rubble in their wake. So basically these things, um, it's sort of a post-apocalyptic setting. There's lots of, uh, there's lots of, you know, bits of civilization that are kind of coming back up and then the Imago come almost wipe it all out and then you go back down and you have to start over again. And so there's sort of like a wreck, uh, a psychic wreckage of Earth. You know, what is Cloud Empress? Cloud Empress is an ecological science fantasy scene that places you in the world ruled by the patterns of giant magical cicadas. So it's not locusts, they're cicadas. Find a way to li thrive, live, and love in the psychic wreckage of Earth, scavenging in the junk of the ancient people who abandoned it. And it's, that's one of the ideas is that uh, you, a bunch of people just left. Uh, and so there were people who were left behind, and that's who you are. Really, really, really interesting. <laughs> that art, I love it. Summer traveling parties, for all its danger, the summer's also warm and free. The summer's a time of great migration in the lowland wastes. Folk collectively yawn, stretch legs, and get to traveling after a hard winter in tight quarters. And you have different kinds of things. You have the body hoppers, which is really creepy. The slip. Character creation, and you get a great little character sheet here, although it's broken into two pages. But you get the different jobs you can have, which are sellsword, lordling, magician, and courier. Um, <laughs> great image there. Sellsword and sellswords uh, can handle themselves in a fight, but long to find a horn, uh, home. What were you doing last, and what's your gear? And you get the lordling. What were you doing last, and your gear? Uh, you get the magician, and then of course his frog people. You get the couriers. Scrappy travelers who witness the best and worst of the world. Uh, what else are you traveling with? And your skills. You get the Imago here. Really, really, really creepy and weird. But, but they're not just evil. They're actually not evil. But they're powerful and you don't mess with them. Um, you find these dead Imago. You can collect chalk, which is their sort of, um, uh, you know, bits that are left. <laughs> Molting carapace. Um, cloudlings, you get the different ancestries, races, or if you want to call them. Cloudlings, farmerlings. Um, and then you get Vessel of an, uh, of an Empire, Cloud Empress. And you get the rules for the book. As you guys can see, I mean, it's really, really interesting. The art, for the most part, is just really good. And this is, again, this is the first edition. The newer one is coming out, and I think it's going to have a whole bunch of stuff that goes along with it and a bunch of adventures. There are a few adventures out there already for it that are set in this setting. Um, violence. Um, you got to, you know, sometimes use violence. This setting is not all about fighting first. It's not definitely not, you know, a, a primarily combat-based game, it seems. But there's obviously rules for it, and damage and wounds seem pretty bad, so you don't want to, um, yeah, you want to sort of avoid fighting as much as possible. At least it seems to me. Um, animals, friends, and foes. So there's a lot of creatures you can run into here. There's the Imago life cycle. Really cool. And then a uh, really interesting piece of art there. Then you get a glossary at the very end. Really cool piece of art. With uh, the last pages for the appendices at the end. I think this is a really interesting setting. Really, really interesting. Really engaging. It's got a little element of that body horror, but not as much as I find in a lot of Mothership products. It's not as horrific. It's more melancholy. But there's like a sort of, I don't know, there's sort of like a joy in the melancholy. I don't know. There's, it, it's an interesting setting, and it's definitely philosophically grounded. Um, whether or not you agree with the philosophy. It has a kind of coherency to it that isn't just sort of random, um, interesting ideas. It blends together quite well. Although there is a, a lot of the sort of like, we're going to add this idea and that idea in. So, Cloud Empress, I, I suggest you guys check it out. And if you are interested in it, and again, most of the stuff you can get is free, but um, or pay what you want. But if you are interested in it, then you can go and you know back the Kickstarter for the new edition that's coming out. And I think it's an interesting one. It's certainly worth looking into at the very least. And again, that inspiration, I think it's very coherent and it definitely has a vibe, right? Definitely has a vibe. 
All right, the next one, the last one I'm going to look at is the Wild Sea. This is a really interesting idea. First of all, the art is really cool. It's very, very like, um, it reminds me of not the people's faces so much, but the backgrounds and the sort of way that the things are, are put in here. It reminds me a bit of the second style of art for a lot of the One Ring books. So it's the, not the, uh, not the, you know, the line of ink, like, illustrations, but the more vague, nebulous art. It looks a lot like that, as you'll see. But th there's also others as you go through the book. So this is a whole, again, this is not just a setting. This is rules, and uh, so it's a, it's a new s system. But there's also a setting in here, and so you can get that and just use the setting if you don't want to use the system as well, because there's, you know, a whole bunch of stuff there. But it's a really cool setting. Some 300 years ago, the empires of the world were toppled by a wave of fast-growing greenery, a tide of rampant growth spilling from the west. This event, the Verdancy, gave rise to the world you'll explore as you play a titanic expanse of rustling waves and sturdy bows known as the Wild Sea. Now, chainsaw-driven ships cut their way across dense tabletop, treetop waves, their engines powered by oil fruit, rope golems, honey, and pride. The crews are motley humanity's weather descendants, rubbing shoulders with the cactoid gunslingers, centipedal po poets, and silk-clothed spider colonies, humanesque slugs with driftwood bones and other stranger things. So essentially, the world is an entire forest, a massive forest, um, and they grow super fast, and you you know they're just over overflowing things, and you have a, you have ships that like ride on top of the green waves or float above them. There are some places that are still rocky, some rocks that still reach above mountain peaks that are still inhabited. But for the most part, people are living on tops of these changing forests and moving around. It's a really cool idea. Here's the core concepts of the setting. Treetops are a sea. Land is scarce and valuable. Plant growth is rampant. Open flames are forbidden. Uh, Kreserin corrupts on contact, which is uh, a potent toxin. The economy is barter-based, and it's a weird, weird world. Absolutely, I would agree with that. There's some cool bits of fiction in here as well. The rustling waves, different islands, reefs, rifts, tall shanks, spits. The layers of the sea, right? Because this is a sea you can go down. So there's the skies, the broad blue expanse above. The thrash, which is the topmost layer of the great iron-rooted trees that make up the wild sea. There's the tangle. Uh, you can go down a little below the sink, lower from that, the drown, the point of ocean, the branches thin and light dies. The trunks of the iron roots that hold up the rest of the sea loom in the darkness some hundreds of feet across, and the darkness under eaves. The roots of the wild sea and the bones of the old world. The less said about this place, the better. Already, right? You just read through that description of the layers, and you're drawn in. I'm drawn in. I can imagine adventures set in the different things. I can imagine airships and, you know, it's like I love Skies of Arcadia Legends or Skies of Arcadia generally. When I was a kid um, on the Sega Dreamcast and on the GameCube, uh, I played those games. I played the one on the GameCube just to death. I played like 100 hours of it. And um, anything with airships, I'm a sucker for. But this is like that with a different twist. Instead of just being out in the air, flying around from Sky Island to Sky Island, you're like... There's also this green element, and I love I love that idea, the images of it. I don't like the noise that is implied of these buzzsaw, chainsaw ships cutting through all the trees. I don't like the noise of it, because I think part of the beauty of sailing and part of the beauty of, of, of flying with those airships is this silence, right? is the wind and the sounds there. So I do think that kind of cuts away from it, but that's just my own imagination. Obviously, other people aren't going to care. <laughs> it's a great setting. Here's the core four races or species as they're presented here. You have the Ardent, the Gal, the Teslacray, Tzelacray, and the Ectus. Ectus are cactus people. Ardents are human descendants. The Gal are fungus. And then the Tzelacray are spiders, hive mind of spiders, which is really gross because I am very kind of arachnophobic, but it's kind of cool. You have the wild sailors. Right? These are the ships that... Uh, that sail through. <laughs> They're super funny. I like them. Super cool looking. And then you get information about the full release of the sea. Because when this Quickstarter came out, um, it hadn't yet released, I think, and you can still get the Quickstarter for free. Um, but the actual game, the first set of books is all out, I think. You have the core rules of the wild, and it's pretty much... Um, well, it's what I would consider a, a pretty standard system. It doesn't stand out to me as like, whoa, this is crazy or, or, or crazy weird or anything like that. Um, basically, you just get a certain set of edges, which are the things that you're a little bit better at. You get extra T6s when you act in alignment with those. You get skills and you get extra dice in um, 
in those situations, and then basically other than that, you have just role-playing stuff and things that can give you advantage in certain situations and the resources. So it's very straightforward in terms of its system. Um, but that's fine, because I think the, the, the part that I find really, really cool is the is the system. And there's also a crew sheet, which is kind of cool, because you're going to be using your, your ship to fly around, and so it's kind of cool that there's a system for how to run your ships as you go through. The structure of the game, again, this is based on the particular style of play. You wouldn't have to do it if you didn't want to. Um, tracks and how to, to make mark progress towards different things in the background, which is kind of cool that it sets that as sort of the standard. I always like that. Sort of reminds me of Mouse Ritter and Faction Play in the background. And then you get the different kinds of actions and how you build up a dice pool. If you have your edge, skill, and advantage, you add those all together and then you roll. And uh, that's it, right? Um, then you had, how do you read the dice? I like D6 systems. I always like D6 systems. Um, and so I, I really like this sort of this sort of one. Uh, the cuts and the impact of those things. Uh, then again, more information in the full release about more sort of running example, more information, these some tracks on what they can represent and uh, dealing with more rule release. But that's the basic idea here. Uh, modes of play and how to play the game. And again, a lot of this stuff is just the system. I'm less interested in the system of this of this whole world. What I'm interested in is the world itself. But the system, I think, fits well enough with that. It's a great piece of art there. Terrifying piece of art, really. Um, how to create characters. There's a guy with a guitar and a goat head. That's just amazing. Um, you get your backgrounds, your edges, your skills, languages, aspects, resources, Myers drives, benefits, interests, tracks, milestones, and then the different... Uh, uh, descendants or the different ancestries. Uh, you get the Ardent, you get the Ectus, the Gao, and the Zelkre. And then you get the Origins, which are where you're from, it seems to me. Um, yeah, and there's different ones. You can be people who were born on one of those bits of land. You can be people who were born on the uh, a ship, born this way, that way. You know, lots of different, uh, maybe classes is a way of looking at that, or rather, yeah, sets of, of, of kits and, and aspects that you can get. There's a great spit, that's what they call it. It's one of a bit of land, and you can see the ships flying around and sailing around below. And the different ships, creating your own ship, rules for that. And I think this is really cool, too, all the different underfittings and, and the crew and all that stuff. With, again, there's going to be way more than that in the full release. This just reminds me of, I don't know, like I could see I could see a, like an anime or a, or a cartoon being set in this world um, very, very well. I think it would fit with the uh, with I don't know I just have a very, very maybe it's just me but I have a like a very clear very clear visual images in my head for many aspects of this game and I think that's really really cool. Um, once again, kind of getting through a lot of the background stuff, but then you have the playtest uh, uh, a reach, which is an expanse of the rustling waves. This is an actual place, and this is where you get a lot of the information about what the setting will be like. You have the fox loft, uh, the different hunting families there. <laughs> the rightlings or the ritlings, uh, the foxloft bestiary, you get acid jet lotus or spore cloud, hidden snare, sailing stone, a pin wolf. Well, that's really cool. The lion's mane, a large plant horror, a burst of golden petals sitting atop four wide spider spread limbs. A lion's mane is a hunting plant with a taste for blood. Usually moving in pairs, they attack in tandem, one rampaging wildly through an area, the other leaping upon any prey that flee the carnage. Use Lion's Mane if you want the crew to face a pair of terrifying single-minded predators. That's kind of cool that they give you a little, like, what, why should you use this? A little in a sentence. That's cool. Oh, storm in tow. A force of nature. That's so cool. Uh, the Iron Jaw Ray. A snapper pillar. Jardico Pirates. The Hallowed. Or Hollowed, excuse me. Skin Thieves. Gross. Old Ornail. And this, again, the art gives you so much inspiration, gives me so much inspiration for running this game. And then you get the last little bit, the character sheet, principal crew sheet, and one example ship. That is the Wild Sea Quick Start. I think this is super cool. And as you guys can see, they're all three very weird. They're all three very unique. Um, Wild Sea, Cloud Empress, and the Painted Wastelands are different than the standard, bog standard D&D setting we've seen a million times, right? Um, now, I like the bog standard D&D setting we've seen a million times. I really enjoy that. I like vanilla as a flavor. <laughs> I like vanilla ice cream. I like vanilla fantasy. Um, I like sword and sorcery, you know, save the princess, kill the sorcerer. I like that. 
I don't, I don't uh, mind the more standard tropes and archetypes and stories. Um, in fact, I'm really drawn to them. But from time to time, to take a delve into one of these very weird settings for me is very fun. And even, again, even in my nor more normal standard games, I tend to inject weirdness, weird things. And this is these are the sorts of games that give you perfect inspiration for that sort of thing. So I highly recommend you guys check these out. If they're up your alley or if you're interested, you know, you should follow up on them. But I'll put links below to where you can get a, a bit of information on them. All right, well, I hope this has been interesting, guys, and I'll see you all in another video.